thank you very much for the kind introduction. I think I switched to English now, at least my slides are prepared in English, and I think it's probably better for everyone here. So today, as Ulrike just pointed out, I'm going to present a little bit about my project that I'm pursuing here. And it's referring to land reform in general and land restitution in particular in South Africa. And that's a project I've been engaged in for more than a decade now, based on ethnographic fieldwork in South Africa. And in recent years, there's a debate that has come very much to the forefront under the um, key term of expropriation without compensation. I thought I'd like to focus on that a little bit today to give you an insight about contemporary debates also and also show a little bit of the relevance, I think, about the research that we are doing and also the kind of political interventions that I've been engaged in. So the title of my talk is Land Restitution, Expropriation Without Compensation and the Quest for Redistributive Justice in South Africa. Um, my talk is structured in four parts. I'll start with an introductory part where I'll give you a little overview about land reform in general and my engagement with that over the past years. I'll point a little bit out about the key issues about expropriation without compensation and redistributive justice before asking a question that I would like to answer in this talk, namely to what an extent expropriation without compensation refers to the real problems that land reform has encountered in South Africa. And I'll then dive into an ethnographic case study as we tend to do and give you some detailed analysis about a land claim that I have been studying very intensely um, for some years. And I present that in two different parts, part two and three, the judicial state on the one hand and the executive state. So I'll focus on uh, jurisprudence and legislation and how that pertained to that particular case. And then also to the executive state, how the administration has tried to implement that and where the problems were in this particular case. And then I'll end in the end in the discussion with an outlook where I summarize a little bit of what I think this case study teaches us about questions of expropriation without compensation and also end up with some normative um, conclusions that I've been drawing in publications that I've been working on in recent months also here in Münster. So let's start with the first part, the introductory part. And as I pointed out already, I've been studying land reform in South Africa and post-apartheid South Africa for more than 10 years. And I ended up studying that because I'm, as a political and legal anthropologist, I'm interested in questions of statehood. So I very much like to study the anthropology of the state, and in particular also bureaucracy, as Ulrike pointed out, but also uh, the legal side of the state. So how the law is actually the mechanisms, the language that the state uses to actually implement its policies. And as an anthropologist, I'm very much interested in the practical side of the state. So how is the state imagined and put into practice in the interplay between people acting in its name, so state officials, but also citizens and other people that they engage in this practice? And how is the law and legal arenas relevant here in these negotiations of what the state actually means? I think the state in South Africa is a particularly interesting question because it was, of course, a very mean state, a very oppressive state, a very colonial state until very recently, until... 1994 when apartheid officially ended. So the state has in various ways tried to reinvent itself since the end of apartheid. So we have a new democratic dispensation and there's a new constitution, many new laws, many reform processes. And many of these you can say are ways in which the state tries to reinvent itself as what I call a morally modern entity. So how do you become an acceptable state for the entire population, not only for the white minority? And land reform for that project, I think, is a very interesting arena. There are several, of course, several reform arenas. There's also the TRC process, the Truth and Reconciliation process that many of you know. But I think land reform is particularly interesting because land is so multidimensional. Land, of course, is an economic resource. You can use it for production, for agriculture. It can be a space where you can find some minerals in the ground. You can build a plant on it and engage in production. You can live on it, so it has a real practical economic dimension. But of course, it's also relevant in terms of identity, politics of belonging. People have been removed, have been displaced from their place, so they are returning. It's very important for communities. It's important for cultural groups, for ethnic groups, and also as a realm for political authorities and jurisdiction, especially if one thinks beyond the state and also in terms of legal pluralism of different forms of customary law, for instance. So all these kind of negotiations go on in the process of land reform. And land reform in South Africa has basically three different lags. It has land restitution, land redistribution, and tenure reform. Land redistribution basically means that the state tries to hand over land to people who are um, disadvantaged, who are, don't have access to land according to their dis demographic participation in society. 
That's interesting, but what I have studied more intensely is land restitution, where there's the idea that people used to have rights in land and they were taken away from them and now the state tries to restore them. So it's really about historical redress, of trying to undo historical injustices. In all these three dimensions, and tenure reform is basically about people who live in unsecure circumstances and how you can give them more secure tenure, there's of course always the question of justice. It's a question of how to redress the massively unequal distribution of resources in South Africa and land, of course, is one of them. So for a very long time, the white minority was owning more than 80%, 87% of the land, and only 13% was actually put aside in so-called reserves or homelands for the black majority population. So how do you change this kind of ownership structure is a massive question of distributive justice and given the starting point being so unjust of redistributive justice. In order to study that, I've uh, conducted ethnographic fieldwork in various um, periods of times, so over time mostly between 2010 and 2016, a total of 15 months of fieldwork. And as I'm interested in the state, I did a lot of fieldwork also in state institutions, and that is in particular in the Land Claims Court, which, which is a specialist court established to deal with land con controversies, in the Commission on Restitution of Land Right, which is part of the Ministry of Land Reform, and then I selected a number of case studies that I found very interesting because they cover very diverse spectra of this uh, question of land reform. And then I followed them up and all of these case studies are connected to the former homeland of Kwan de Bele, which is the former homeland of the so-called Ndebele ethnic nation, which is northeast of Pretoria. If you have a rough idea, I'll show you a map of South Africa in a moment. So they are all related to that, but they are very diverse in their layout. And one of the cases I'm going to speak about is one of these four cases today. Okay, so that's the general setup, what I've been doing over the past 10 years. And then in different moments in time, since the 2010s, there have been historical processes that have intervened, if you want, in this general land reform process and have introduced massive changes. And I'm focusing on the latest of these debates of recent years, and that's the debate on expropriation without compensation. And that was a political process. It's still ongoing, but it was a legal process that mostly lasted between 2018 and 2021. In certain ways, it's still ongoing, and I'll talk about that in a moment. But it started with a decision by the, National, by the African National Congress, the ruling party, in December 2017 on its party um, conference to put a motion in place that we should move towards a, um, a possibility for expropriation without any compensation in land reform matters. And that was then put to the table on the, uh, in the National Assembly in February 2018. And then there was a joint constitutional review committee established to inter interrogate and study the question whether such a, a command, uh, amendment of the constitution would be feasible and, and reasonable to do. So there were massive public hearings. I was in South Africa at the time. Thousands and thousands of people were heard in public meetings. People could make written submissions. It was the strongest pu public participation in in such a process since the constitutional process. More than 500,000 written submissions were made in that question. It's a very politicized issue. Everyone in South Africa has an opinion on it. So it's very, very uh, strongly mobilizing. People have very po polarized views on the question of expropriation without compensation. This joint committee then came up with a recommendation that yes, the constitution should be amended. And then they finally drafted the constitution 18th amendment bill, which then was rejected in December uh, 21 because, of course, for a constitutional amendment you needed a two-third majority, and the ANC could not have that majority without the minority part of the Economic Freedom Fighters, the EFF, with whom they joined, joined forces for a very long time, but then had a fallout. So the EFF did not support the constitutional amendment, which they found did not uh, satisfy their radical demands for redistribution. So this process faltered. But there is an ongoing um, process of uh, renewing the expropriation bill and that explicitly provides for expropriation without compensation as well. So the process is still ongoing and many people, myself included, have been arguing that expropriation without compensation has been constitutionally possible all along anyway, so there's no need to change the constitution. So what's the political process or context for this kind of debate and why did it become so, so urgent? Well, as I said, there have been many state reform processes ongoing since the 1990s, aiming at redistributive justice in various ways. And while there was a very big excitement in the 90s and 2000s, also internationally, about the very progressive South African constitution and all the hopes put into the law, since the 2010s, there is a kind of downfall and a decline in excitement about constitutional, uh, transformative constitutionalism, as it is called. Because people feel reforms are far too slow, they are not reaching the people, it's not really producing the effects that they should have. And also the government is highly corrupt, 
President Zuma was replaced in 2017 at precisely that ANC conference where this motion was taken up. And there's an ongoing process against corrup about corruption um, in his case and many other party cronies under the label of state capture. So the ANC is losing massive support. In 2013, a, a group of left radicals broke away and formed the Economic Freedom Fighters, as I mentioned. And internally in the ANC, there's a split between those who are pro-Zuma in the camp of the former President Zuma, and they self-style as left populists and very, have very close positions to the EFF. And then you have more market-oriented, more middle-of-the-road um, factions supporting the current President Ramaphosa, and they are fighting internally. And you can see that this motion in 2017 was a kind of political compromise. Ramaphosa won the day on the election to become the new president of the party, but as a compromise, they had to have this kind of resolution for economic uh, for, the, for the expropriation without compensation, and that was then put into the pr uh, process. President Ramaphosa never hid the fact that he didn't like it, that he thought it was a wrong thing to do, and he was worrying about economic stability and international investment, and the process faltered anyway, so it's not a big problem. Um, I'm not too sure that nobody, that the people actually expected it to come through in the first place. I think it was a political ploy right from the beginning. But I'm moving ahead of my time. I'm coming back to that in the, in the conclusion and the discussion in the outlook. Let's first step back and ask the question that I'd like to address in this talk, namely whether the absence of the possibility for expropriation without compensation, that's how the supporters have styled it, has been the main obstacle for redistributive justice in the field of land reform all along. So is this really the solution to all the problems? And if we introduced it, then we would have a better form of redistributive justice. And being an anthropologist, I answer this general question by, very, uh, by a very detailed uh, case study diving into particular case materials, which I then claim is representative of general processes in South Africa, so we can learn a lot about land reform by focusing on these particular cases. And I draw on uh, articles and uh, book chapters that I published on that case already, one of it being my chapter and the book that you mentioned, Ulrike, about the state and the paradox of customary law in Africa, which we also partly discussed yesterday in the reading group. Okay, but before I do that, let me just give you a very, very brief outlook on the general legal technicalities of the land restitution process. So first of all, we have the new constitution in South Africa. We first had an interim constitution in 1993, and then after the first democratic election, there was a constitutional assembly and they produced the new constitution which was accepted and then promulgated in 1996. So that's the current constitution. And in this current constitution, in the Bill of Rights in section 25, we have the property clause. So what is it that the property clause is actually saying? Well, as all kind of liberal modern constitutions, or many of them at least, um, put forward, it protects private property on the one hand, right? So you cannot take private property away unless it is for a public purpose or in the South African case more broadly defined for a public interest. So private property, first of all, is protected. And that also protects, of course, the unequal distribution of property that post-apartheid inherited, right? So that's the good news for white landowners, for instance. But at the same time, the property clause also um, puts a constitutional duty on the state to engage in a massive land reform. So land reform is not a policy choice of the government. There's a constitutional duty inscribed in the property section that the state must engage in land restitution, land redistribution, and tenure reform. Right? So these are the three streams that follow from the constitutional property clause, and both are brought together in the property clause is if you want a compromise between these negotiations ongoing and it actually gives the state the duty to engage, for instance, in land restitution. So on the basis of this property clause then, various land laws were passed in the 1990s in particular. And especially one of the first was the Restitution of Land Rights Act that was put into practice in 1994, even before the final constitution came into place. And that's the framework then which spells out the constitutional duty on land restitution. It establishes the Land Claims Court that I mentioned before as a specialist court. It establishes the Commission on Restitution of Land Rights as that agency within the Ministry of Land Reform that drives the restitution process. And of course, it establishes the eligibility criteria according to which people can claim land that they lost under apartheid or under colonialism. Among these eligibility criteria, one is important for the case later on, namely that only land rights that were lost after 1913 can be actually restored. So we are not going back until 1652 when Jan van Riebeck first hit the ground on, on what is today Cape Town. 
all the colonial dispossessions before 1913 are excluded for various reasons, because there was so much movement, various African groups took land from each other as well, there would be a nightmare to solve that. So it's really only 20th century dispossession, or so at least most people thought, and we will see that it is not as easy as people thought. So most dispossession must have happened after 1913. And what is also very important is that the type of rights in land that people may have had and which they were dispossessed of include much more than technically accepted freehold ownership. So it's not only about ownership as the colonial state accepted it. It includes all kinds of informal land rights as well. Customary land rights, beneficial occupation, labor tenants rights, and so on and so forth. So that also means that for the same piece of land, there can be successive waves and generations of communities that might have acquired rights and lands, and then they were evicted or dispossessed, and they all have valid claims on the same piece of land, making the thing very complicated. What is very interesting for an anthropologist of the state like myself is that in this particular setup, the state has three ultimately not very compatible functions, right? So the state is on the one hand on the side of the claimants. So claimants are individuals who claim for themselves individually or who claim on behalf of communities, families, local groups, but also ethnic groups. So these are the claimants. But because we are dealing with a process of social equity, the state feels that it must make an extra effort to help people to claim land because many of these people are literally illiterate and also legally illiterate, so they don't know how to do it. So the commission is actually mandated to help claimants with their claim, right? It's not a neutral agency which waits for people to lodge their claim. Once the claim is there, they are active in supporting claimants once they have established the validity of the claim. So they are really on the side of the claimants. And if you go to court, you usually have the claimants and their legal representatives and representatives of the states being on their side, literally. But then the state is also the defendant. So the claim is not lodged against current landowners. Current landowners are only affected when it comes to fair and equitable compensation. The claim is against the state as the successor of the colonial state. It's not against the current landowner. So the same minister who is overse uh, overseeing the commission that helps the claimant is the addressee of the claim. Right? So you always lodge the claim against the current minister. Right? But obviously, uh, the minister would not contradict what his uh, staffs would actually support in particular cases. So usually there's no conflict. There can be conflicts, though, of course, with current landowners. Because they might say, well, the case is not valid. Right? I don't accept the validity of the claim. And then the case ends up in court. Right? And that's the third role, then. The state is also the arbiter of the conflict presiding in the land claims court over land conflicts between itself against itself, right? So we have a three type uh, involvement of the state in which the state or different parts of the state simultaneously engage with each other and try to solve legal land conflicts. And I'm going to focus on that here by dividing it up and looking on the judicial side first and then looking at the implementation side of the administrative state and the executive state on the other. Okay, so let's move to the second part of my presentation namely the judicial state and transformative property regimes. And as I said, I'll focus on a particular land claim, an example, namely the claim on a farm which has the despicable name Kafaskral. That's how it was named in the 18th century, uh, to be precise, in 1872, when the name first appeared on the first official title deed handed out by the then Transvaal Republic. Right? Kafas Kral is a very negative term, of course, because Kafa is a very negative term for an African person, and Kral is, a, uh, is an uh, enclosure for cattle. Right? And it obviously refers to the fact that on that piece of land, African people with cattle were living. And that was actually used, but I'm not going into that detail, in court to prove the case that this was actually inhabited by African people. This is an area which is very multi-ethnic. There were lots of migrations going on for various reasons during the 19th century. One of the groups that were living there were so-called Ndebele people, people who speak Isin Ndebele. So it's an ethnic group. And in their language, the place is called Kwamakuse, right? That's the local name that people use. But I continue to refer to it as Kafaskra because that's the official title in the title deed and also in the legal proceedings. Kwamakuse is part of a wider area which is locally called Mahlungulu. And I'll come back to that as well. This farm is situated about 200 kilometers to the northeast of Pretoria. It has a size of about 4,200 hectares, which is subdivided in three portions, and that's very typical. So initially, most farms, or many farms, depends on the area, have a, have a size of about 4,000, 5,000 hectares. But then often with families, it was subdivided, and then you have many owners. 
and is a very valuable piece of land for South African standards because it's at the so-called escarpment. So we have the high felt in South Africa. I don't know whether you've been there. Much of South Africa is very high, more than 1,500 meters high. And so it's very dry. It's, it's good as um, summer grazing, but in winter it's a bit difficult, right? So you have summer and winter grazing, and this piece of land is very interesting because it's on the border of it. And I see, show you pictures at the moment, so you can actually have cattle and drive them up and down in a kind of transhuman um, cattle grazing. Kaffer's Kral was important for me, or I drew my attention, because it was one of the first cases that ended into the court and were dealt with in the court. And as South Africa has a mixed legal system, also with common law elements and precedent and case law, it produced lots of important precedent decisions, which then later on affected um, land restitution more generally. So I learned about that case through case law, right? So it has important judgments from 2002, 2005, 6, and 9. And I focus on 2002 and 5 later on. So I started with the judgments, and then I followed up on all the kind of key elements, spoke to the different claimant communities, landowners, their lawyers, land activists, and so on and so forth. So here you see a map of South Africa and the rough location of the farm Kafaskral. And what you can see is that it is now situated in the southern part of the Limpopo province. I say now because it used to be situated in the northern part of the Mpumalanga province. So the provincial boundary was actually moved in 2005, and that has legal consequences, and I'll come back to that later. So today it is in Limpopo. It used to be in Pumalanga. Here you see also some photographs I took. This one is a photograph from 2010, and here you see the escarpment, how it goes up, and here's the grazing. This is an aerial photograph. I took a, or got a couple of aerial photographs that the state took at different po points in time to see how the land actually evolved. This one was taken in 1951, and you see here introduced the boundaries of that particular farm. So this is the piece of land we are dealing with. As I said before, um, this is an area which is very multi-ethnic, has a long migration history, so it's very complicated to say who was living where, when, at what time, whether it was homogenous groups, it was usually mixed groups, various language groups, various kingdoms, various chieflets, different um, Boer republics that emerged and disappeared. So there's a lot of thing going on at the time. But what is important is that also the Ndebele communities, or a particular community of the Ndebele and Zunza Ndebele, in that part were residing in that area. And while initially supporting or having contracts with the, Republic, uh, the Boer Republic at the time, they then ended up having a war, uh, the so-called Mapoch War in 1882-83, which they lost. And because at that time, uh, it was the colonial policy to regard political uh, authority as being coextensive with property rights, it was assumed that because then the Bela lost the war, they also lost basically all property rights. So after the war, all if there had ever been a, an assumption of property rights on the side of Ndebele, they were all extinguished. So Ndebele people became actually indentured labor for five years, were distributed in the entire Transvaal region, and then stayed on mostly as labor tenants and later as farm laborers. So the people stayed in the area, but underneath their, their feet, so to speak, all their property rights were taken away in 1882-83. That's also important. I come back to that. On that particular piece of land here, of course, people also stayed on, and also the the chief, or the brother of the chief rather, because the chief was put into prison, and he stayed there and kept the royal kraal on that piece of land. At various points in time, the tribe actually tried to buy the land back from various landowners, but because of the so-called Natives Land Act of 1913, which basically zoned the entirety of South Africa into racial zones, and that fell into white areas, black people couldn't get property rights. They couldn't buy it. So they had the money, but they were not allowed to buy it. So they stayed on the land. They were um, kept as labor tenants, they were tolerated by white landowners, but then in the 30s the land was sold and the new landowner wanted to get rid of them and he forced them to leave. So he expelled them and they were forcibly removed to the north, further up the high felt, into a native reserve, which later became the homeland Leboa. So they were finally removed from the piece of land in the 1930s. The royal descendants, which were moved, were then in 1957 officially recognized by the apartheid state as a so-called tribal authority. So the Bantu Authorities Act of 1951 allowed to recognize customary law and official customary law and recognize the institution of a chief as a state recognized, indirect rule chief, so to speak. And this was the first in the Bela tribal authority that was recognized. So that's why this particular Ndebele authority was called Ndebele tribal authority. 
and not further specified because it was the very first Ndebele Tribal Authority that was accepted. And that ex still exists until today. But there are many more Ndebele Tribal Authorities today, but they have different names, right? But it was the very first chief that was state recognized as a customary ruler. Then in 1994, when apartheid came to an end and the new constitution and the restitution of land rights act allowed the claiming of land under restitution, there were of course thousands of people submitting land claims, right? And as I said, because the different rights and land entitling you to restitution are cumulative, you can have hundreds and thousands of overlapping claps for the same piece of land, right? And then you have people claiming only for your individual, others claiming for communities of which you are actually part. So they're very complex situations in which people, numerous people claim land. So there were also, of course, numerous overlapping land claims regarding the farm Kafferskraut. After the Land Claims Commission did a first uh, prima facie checkup of all these kind of claims, they realized that this claim was probably valid, right? So they said there is a community claim which was put forward, we accept it, it's valid, so we will process and um, engage with land restitution. Of the three portions, one landowner was willing to sell and he sold his piece directly to the state, was financially compensated, got his money, was out of the picture. But then there were two landowners and one you can see here, the family, the Butter family, and there was another family, they said, well, this cannot be possible. This can simply not be the case that this is a valid claim. So they opposed the validity of the claim. And since the commission couldn't solve that amicably, it was deferred to the land claims court. And that's how it ended up being one of the first cases in the land claims court and producing precedent that I was mentioning before. Here to the left, you see the claimant committee, Sibuele Kaya, which means we are going home. And this gentleman here is Simon Shabangu, and he was one of the people who lodged a land claim for that area, and we come back to him in a moment. So he became the representative, and this group became the elected committee representing the group claim that ended up in court. Now, as we are talking about the judicial state and the transformative property regimes that instantiated in land restitution, let's look at the legal arguments. So what were the arguments that were put forward in court? First in the land claims court in 2002, and then after the white land claimants lost, uh, landowners lost, again in the Supreme Court of Appeal in 2005. So what the landowners were saying, well, hang on, land restitution is only applicable to dispossession after 1913. But we actually have this land in family ownership since 1872, even before the Mapoch War. And they showed me physically the title, title deed from 1872, which was in family possession. So this Butter family actually owned that piece of land continuously since 1872, right? So they said, well, how could it possibly be that we have dispossessed African people if we own the land in freehold ownership since 1872, which by definition is the most comprehensive right in land you can have? So any other right in land that people could have had or have developed must have been minor rights because by definition, ownership is the strongest right you can have. So we cannot have dispossessed anybody. We could possibly not have a case of a valid land claim. Okay, are you with me? So that was basically the argument and it sounds very reasonable, I think. So they said, well, after 1913, whatever they lost when they were deported, this must have been lesser rights, personal rights, some other forms of rights, but not property rights as we have them. We have the strongest right. We can prove it. We were in the title deed. We have in the, in the deed registry. We have the printed out uh, original title deed. This cannot be true. Well, the claimants argued differently and the courts followed their reasoning. So the claimant said, well, yes, that's true. There was a a colonial state that handed out a title deed and you held that title deed since 1872, but actually the rights and land that we had, and it was variously described, first as customary law, then they, they opted for beneficial occupation, I think for strategic reasons, it doesn't really matter. They're both recognized in the, in the um, legislation anyway. We had rights like beneficial occupation and they have persisted despite the superimposition of white title deed ownership rights, right? And dispossession was not a one-off event. Dispossession was a cumulative process. We were also dispossessed not only of the particular rights and land in this particular piece, but when the 1930 Natives Land Act came and say, you can never ever own land in this region, that's a form of generalized dispossession too. And then when we tried to buy it and we couldn't, that's an indirect form of dispossession too. And then in the 1930s when we were deported, we were very, very literally dispossessed because we were forced off from our own piece of land that we used before. So these are all layers of rights and land that we lost successively and also after 1913, right? And the court says, that's right. 
Okay, so let's look at two sentences only from the Supreme Court of Appeal judgment, which I find very telling. So the Supreme Court of Appeal judgment says, and I quote, the fact that registered title exists neither necessarily extinguishes the rights in land that the Restitution Act contemplates, nor prevents them from arising, unquote. And another quote, the Restitution Act also recognizes the significance of registered title of ownership, but it does not afford it unblemished primacy, right? Unquote. So what the court is basically saying, yes, it's good to have ownership. It's not that we are not taking ownership into consideration, but it's only one factor and it is not the strongest right in land that you can have, right? Evidently, if you talk to the white landowners today, they say we, we are in, 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 a, in a state of maniac, right? This is completely crazy because ownership by definition is the strongest right in land. How could a judge in a court sit and say, well, it is not the strongest right in land? It obviously is. Well, why is it and how is it possible? Because I argue there's a fundamental disagreement or misunderstanding about what kind of property regime we are actually in. If we were, as the white landowners assumed, in an ordinary conventional property regime, they would be right, right? But we are not, right? Land restitution is a transitional justice situation in which an exceptional jurisprudence is developed to redress historical injustices. And for that reason, the ordinary logic of private property is set aside and questions of equity are put in place, right? So we're actually dealing with a transformative property regime, which is put in place through successive levels of law. First of all, through the constitutional property clause, then through the Restitution Act, which recognizes rights in land that are lesser than ownership, as also valid, and then through jurisprudence and case law, which as in this case very prominently did, recognize that you can have lesser rights that historically trump ownership, which was stronger rights in the old dispensation. Okay? So for this reason, the court ordered the white land owners that they must hand over the land. And there are basically two ways of doing this. Either you agree into a forced sale, so the state offers you a certain amount of money and then you say, okay, I will, I will take it, right? So you make a contract and you sell the land or the state can expropriate you. And just as a nice side remark to just show how absurd this whole expropriation without compensation debate is, everybody says that there are no cases in which the state ever used expropriation in land reform, which is not true. Here, the landowners wanted to be expropriated. Why is that so? Because according to expropriation law in South Africa and many other jurisprudences, uh, jurisdictions, um, if you are expropriated, the moment that the state takes possession and it doesn't pay, it must pay interest, right? And as the South African state is famous for making contracts it doesn't honor, the landowners and their lawyers insisted to be expropriated because then the state had to pay interest and it was massive interest because the state paid out much later, right? So it was actually in the interest of the landowners to be expropriated rather than to have a forced sale. I know of other cases where people um, were um, giving the state the benefit of the doubt and they are waiting until today because the, the amount they agreed on dates back 10 years. The land is 10 times more valuable today, but the agreement is actually not was not honored, the state didn't pay out, right? So actually it was in the interest of the landowners to be expropriated rather than to agree to a forced sale. Anyway, in terms of law, and that's what I'm trying to say here, this is a success, a success story, right? We have a judicial state which is very transformative, it has a transformative property regime, it puts things that many people would agree is just given the circumstances, it um, doesn't unduly put um, weight on the current landowners, they are fairly compensated, and people who were dispossessed in the past get their rights, right? So it sounds like a good story. The judicial state is successful. So let's look at the other side, and I'm coming to part three now, to the executive state, to the administration, how it has been actually processed by the administration and put into practice. How has this judgment been put into practice? And that was what I was observing while doing field work between 2010 and 2012, because the judgments were already much older, of course, right? So I was going to the land, to the farm, talking to the people and say, well, okay, so you must be all very happy because you won in court, you have the land transferred now, so you must be living happy ever after. Unfortunately, they weren't, right? But rather, we had a situation where the land claim was won against the landowners, but the community was internally completely at dire straits and fighting, right? So there were lots of infighting going on. And that's a very common problem in land reform in South Africa and especially in land restitution, right? So there were persisting conflicts between the elected committee, this group here, who were actually those who represented the community in court, and then this group, in particular there were other sub subgroupings, but these are the most important ones, and these are the contemporary members of the Royal Council, of the traditional council of the Ndebele Tribal Authority that was established in 1957, right? 
So because there were infighting going on, the state didn't know to whom to transfer the property, the title deed, right? So it hadn't transferred it at the time. Right? And I was actually following up on all the meetings they were having and was doing interviews with both sides and talking to the lawyers and to the commission officials and going with them to the meetings there and people trying to implement that. And it was all very complicated, which also resulted, of course, to the situation that people vaguely knew that they were beneficiaries of the land claim, but they didn't know what their rights in land were and whom to talk to, how to administer the land, what to do with it. Can we build a house here? Can we do some farming? Can we do some mineral inspecting? It was all very unclear. Why was that so? Why was the implementation so complicated? In order to make it a little bit more schematic and understandable, I distinguish between three different implementation contexts. So let's look at the first implementation context, lasting from roughly 1995 to 2005. 1995 was when the first land claim for that piece of land was submitted. So between 1995 and 1998, that was the cutoff date for land claims in South Africa generally, numerous claims for that piece of land were submitted by individuals, but also by people speaking on behalf of entire groups and communities, right? And these obviously not only refer to Kafferskral, but sometimes there were claims also for various farms, several farms, including Kafferskral. So you have a kind of patchwork overlapping of many claims in that area. One claim that was lodged was, as I said, by Simon Shabangu, the gentleman I showed you here, who lodged a claim on behalf of a group he called Sibuhile Kaya, which in Sindebele means we are going home. Like, so he said, we have a community, we are going home, and I'm claiming for the people who used to live here who were dispossessed, and I want Kafaskra back. But then there was also a community claim that was lodged by the then tribal authority, the Sindebele tribal authority, Chief Mahlangu. And he lodged a claim for the entire Mahlungulu area of 17 farms, including Kafaskra, right? And he lodged, he used the, the, um, the claim form, but he also submitted a long letter explaining the history of customary law, tradition of um, Nibele culture, why he as the king was supposed to get the land and all that, right? Which was legally immaterial, but just to show you the kind of reasoning, okay? Now, as I said, the reason is very multi-ethnic. So there are many people, Pedi people, Tswana people, Nibele people, various subgroupings. So it's a nightmare administratively. But Kafas Kral looked simple. So we are actually talking about the simple case here. Because all claimants were in the Bele, in that particular farm. So the commission said very reasonably, let's deal first with the simple case and bother about the difficult cases later on. Let's first focus on Kafas Kral, let's single that out and deal with it because actually these people must all be somehow members of the same community. We must be able to consolidate the claim and find a representation of that entire grouping because they are all basically the same group, right? Just individuals claimed from different fam families at different stages. So that's what they did. And then they organized, as they are supposed to do, community meetings where they bring all the descendants from uh, entitled claimants together, and then they are supposed to elect a committee, and that committee is then the unified committee representing the entire claim. And that's what they did, right? So they brought all people together in several meetings, and they got that committee elected, okay? Now, as I said also yesterday in our reading session, when we were talking about different modalities in which um, one legal system might recognize another one, there are different ways of how the state law, the post-apartheid state law, has been dealing with customary law and non-Western, non-modern um, forms of law. And in land law in the 1990s, we have a complete um, ignorance if you want to use it that, that way as the modality we talked yesterday about customary law. So the state pretends it doesn't exist. In land law from the 1990s, it's very modern, it's very individualistic, it's very liberal law. It's about property rights and how to transfer them from um, illegitimate owners to those who should actually have these rights. So there's absolutely no space in land rest, uh, restitution or land reform for customary institutions. Tribes do not exist. Tra traditional councils do not exist, the Nibela Tribal Authority doesn't exist, only individuals who are entitled either to land rights or not, okay? So when the chief came and submitted this claim and said, well, I want to actually have the land on behalf of my Nibela tribe, the commission said, hey, no, 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 that's not possible, right? You are just an ordinary descendant as anybody else here, and you are part of the group, and we must elect a committee. So Peter Nchoe here, who is the state official who was dealing with the case at the time, I followed him up and in an interview he said, Chief Mahlango, I quote him, felt he was the claimant on behalf of the tribe. And I said, no, you are a descendant of one of the people who were removed. Therefore, I have to facilitate the formation of a democratically elected land claims committee. 
unquote. So Peter Choi explained to the chief that being a chief is completely immaterial in land reform. You are just an individual citizen, you're entitled to restitution or not, and you can vote with one vote as anybody else. You could theoretically be on the committee, but hang, let's vote an ordinary democratic committee. So the commission uh, officials at the time were very strongly anti-chief. So what we called yesterday, they were uh, in rejection of customary law, right? So while the law officially ignored customary law, the activists at the time, many of them had been land rights activists in the 80s, actively fought chiefs. So they didn't want them on the committee. So they made sure that the chief would not be elected on the committee. It was an odd, uh, uh, if you want, in, in traditional terms, a committee comprising commoners, ordinary people like um, Simon Shabangu. And they succeeded to get that evo uh, elected, also with the support from the traditional council, but they were very grudgingly agreeing to it. So basically, they did not produce a written letter, which they were supposed to be doing in law, where they would give up their claim on behalf of the elected committee. So that letter was missing, right? That's very important, right? So the, the, the council said, okay, we elect with you, but they did not actually literally subscribe and say, well, we hand over our claim to that community. Okay, then in 2005, two things happened. The first one was there was a redrawing of the boundary between Limpopo and Mpumalanga province. And since land claims are processed in provincial offices, claims had to be transferred. So before they were, uh, were processed in Nelspreit, now they had to be put in Polokwane. So the entire material, the, the files and all the case was handed over to completely new people sitting in a different city who didn't know the story of the claim. And in that process, unfortunately, lots of files got lost, right? Many of the documents were actually missing. And also, of course, the brain, the, the, the brain drain, the knowledge of the case, the, the embodied experience of people processing these claims were lost. Why do I know that the file was incomplete? Because in the beginning, I started to ask people the right to make photocopies from their files. Towards the end, everybody was asking me to make copies, including the state officials, because my file was much more comprehensive than theirs, right? So there were lots of documents actually missing. That produced a situation in which suddenly you had a reset, right? And then the second thing happened, namely new members entered the traditional council, very fierce young members who wanted to, who saw that as their chance, now we can actually get back the land for Ndebele people. And they then said, actually, our land claim was stolen. So they ended up moving to the Polokwane office and said, well, what is actually going on here? We have never heard about our case anymore. Ages ago, we lodged a claim, and suddenly there's this Siboyle Kaya people, and Simon Shabangu, they claim to represent us, but it's our claim. We never signed anything. What, what is going on? So the people in the new office were looking at the files and they were seeing there's no written documentation that the chief ever agreed that they would hand over representation. They actually had a claim for the entire region where this Simon Shabangu, who originally only claimed Kafaskar, was now on the board for all 17 farms. It all looked very fishy, right? So how, did, how does this guy end up there? So they decided in 2011, we make a complete stop. We start all over again. We do the entire thing anew, right? And that was the process that I was observing during field work. And then not knowing what people were knowing, I was asking people about judgments and so on. So one day in 2012, I was sitting with the Royal Council and I said to them, well, how do you actually deal with the 2006 judgment? Because there was another judgment after the Supreme Court of Appeals said it had to be handed over. It, it, it's far too technical to go into that, but basically it meant that the people around Simon Shabangu agreed to give up rights and land for the other farms around it. Not all of them, but some of them. That's a massive effect, right? And obviously the traditional council was not involved. So they were getting very, very aggressive and it was really getting violent also and complicated for me. So I actually had to leave the field. I could not return to that situation anymore, which is really a pity, but it just shows how heated the whole situation was, right? So it was a complete mess, basically. Now the third context, uh, apart from the local context, is the wider national context in South Africa. And here it's really important to bear in mind that the 1990s under the presidency of Nelson Mandela were very strongly modern law oriented periods. Like Mandela was a lawyer, as you know, he was very strongly uh, invested in the constitution. It's not a coincidence that the land laws of the 1990s were not focusing chiefs, it was really on individual rights. But then in 1999, he was replaced by his deputy president, Mpeki, And Mpeki was much more Africanist in his orientation. You might remember the debates we had on HIV, uh, African solutions for HIV and all that. So he was coming out with this notion of African renaissance, African solutions for African problems. So he was actually kicking out all or many white uh, state officials who worked in the departments in the 90s, replaced them with African people and very strongly insisted on giving African customs and traditions more recognition. So many traditional laws 
traditional legal systems were now officially recognized. And new laws were introduced, not in land reform, but in other areas, to give traditional laws state recognition. And that produced a lot of problems, right? So as I said, in the 1990s, state officials were actively trying to get the chiefs out, right? In law, they had no standing anyway, but they actively tried not to get them on the committee. Now in the 2000s, 2005 and beyond, suddenly there are all these laws that give chiefs new um, uplifting power in many other areas, rural development, for instance, right? So suddenly the chiefs feel now our time is coming back. We can actually rule, we can decide. And the poor people, the state officials like Peter and Choi, they have to deal with this mess. So they go out in the rural areas with a judgment from the court saying we have to hand over the land to the Sibuile Kaya committee. And then there's the chief with this royal council and all this traditionalism. They're saying, well, we have actually the power. It's our land. What are these guys doing here and so on? So Peter and Choi put it in these words. I quote, the politicians don't want to come up rightly to say to the chiefs, we have a legislation that says one, two, three, as the officials are saying. They want to please traditional authorities. So that come the elections, traditional authorities will support them and mobilize the rural vote, right? The land laws say the people should administer the land, so a bottom-up democratic process. And then the Traditional Leadership Act, that's one of these legislations that recognize traditional authority in customary law and other contexts, give the chief power. It does not talk about administering the land, but it talks about local development. Now, how do you develop if you do not administer? So we have lots of different laws pertaining to different areas of local governance, of land rights, land reform, and they contradict each other in practice. And the state officials somehow have to navigate this field and deal with these problems on the ground, even though in land, land reform and land law, there is no place for chiefs at all. So in practice, this led to a situation in which the traditional authority gradually got more power. So they could more insist that they are actually controlling it. So even if the elected committee made decisions of what to do with the land, they would not adhere to it. They would demand that Simon Chabango would be herding the, the cattle of the chief and stuff like that, right? So it was really shifting the power towards the chief. So let's look at this um, as a kind of shift in perspective that was related to the increasing relevance of state recognized um, traditional authorities and customary law. So until 2005, as I said, the chief was excluded as a chief, right? That, that's what in law happened. So as I said, in land law, there's no place for traditional authorities. There was, if you want, state ignorance. They didn't re recognize it at all. And that stays the same until today. But beyond that, state officials actively um, discriminated against, if you want, marginalized chiefs because they saw them as puppets of the former colonial regime, right? So they were marginalized. After 2005, because of the incomplete files, and this whole kind of weird situation with Sibuile Kai and these other claims, suddenly the state officials felt, well, actually the legitimate representative must be the chief. He has the claim form for these 17 farms. Sibuile Kai didn't really figure. They never succumbed to that. There's no official documentation that they should be on the committee. So the chief should actually be the representative of the community, but not as a chief, only as the representative of a community claim, right? So again, in law, officially, there was ignorance towards traditional authority. But in practice, of course, it meant that the chief suddenly could say, well, I am, even the state says I should represent the claim, right? So locally, it produced more power on the side of traditional authority and customary law than had been the case before. So in effect, it meant that there was a power shift and drift towards the chief. And then at the time, as I said, when I was doing land reform research in the area, there was big conflicts going on and it was very difficult to solve. So many state officials coming from Pretoria, when I was traveling with them to the rural areas in the evening when they were driving back, they were feeling like, oh gosh, I'm so happy I can go back to the city and just leave that behind, right? Because it's such a nightmare in administrating it. And of course, I, I, I would be very surprised if that claim is solved until today. Okay, let me end then with a short discussion and outlook of what this actually tells us about the question of expropriation without compensation and also the question of where the problems lie with land reform in South Africa. As I tried to show, and I think the example very nicely illustrates this, the jurisprudence and the law of land reform, to my mind at least, is very progressive and tries really to solve situations of dispossession in the past that were produced under unjust colonial systems. So the jurisprudence, the law, the constitution is really, if you want, progressive and pro-poor, if that is the kind of orientation that you want to put in. But then if you look at how the state actually implements that, how it is put into practice, what the consequences of this jurisprudence is, uh, the picture is much more bleak, right? And that is related to 
incompetence if you want. I mean, why should the file, when it moves from Nelspray to Polokwane, suddenly disappear? Why could people not give a proper handover? This is not because people are in principle incapable, but because they have short-term contracts. People use it as a kind of springboard to get a job elsewhere. There's no perspective. It's a temporary process, so you cannot stay in the commission forever. You wouldn't want to stay there. It is a nightmare going out, as I said, locally to try to solve these problems, so you better try to get a job elsewhere. There are many reasons for why you would not stay in that job. The funding is desperate. The state has budgeted only 1% of the annual budget since its existence for land reform. How do you redistribute 30% of the land if you only spend 1% of the annual budget for land reform, but 10%, for instance, on um, military protection of the country, right? This is very, very difficult. As I said earlier, the state makes agreements for forced sales and then it doesn't pay. It's not out of incompetence, it's because of lack of funding, right? So there are many, many problems around surrounding budgetary issues and also to the legal pluralism, which is very unresolved with regard to the role of traditional authorities, which is basically a problem of state policy, right? It's a question of how the executive and the government, the minister, has been dealing with these issues, more so than actually with a question in law. If that is the case, though, then expropriation without compensation is very unlikely to solve that problem, right? Why is that so? Because to begin with, and I didn't talk about that and I can't really spend much time on that, I'm just hinting at it, there are very, very few cases in which expropriation without absolutely no compensation will be legally possible in South Africa, right? The property clause specifies what just and equitable compensation means, and market value is one factor, but only one. There are many other things, the history of acquisition, state subsidies, uh, what the current land users are doing with the land, um, ecological deterioration, and so on. So there are very many factors in which you can press the price if you want, but getting down to zero is a very long, long call, right? It's very, very unlikely that there will be many cases in which this is possible. Partly also because, of course, the property clause, as it should do in a good liberal um, constitution, has a caveat that it must still uh, succumb to the limitations clause, the proportionality principle. So restricting the individual rights of current landowners and giving them nothing must be proportionate and in balance of private interest and public interest, right? So there must be very, very harsh circumstances in which it would be legitimate constitutionally to punish somebody by not giving them anything, right? So actually, we're here dealing, I think, with a window dressing exercise because the actual cases in which this would ever be legally possible are minimal anyway, right? You could pay much less than the state has been paying. Until today, the state mostly pays market value. But the constitution has provided for paying less all along. Had the state wanted to do it, it could have done it all along. They didn't have to change the constitution. If the problem is not the law but implementation, changing the law as a constitutional amendment will not play the trick. The problem is implementation, not the law. Okay? So in that case, it doesn't really help a lot. You could change the constitution. It would have allowed expropriation without compensation in very few cases anyway. It doesn't increase the number of cases if you change the constitution. It will be tested in court. It will block the constitution court for years and it will cost more money for the state to actually process these cases than they are saving through it. So this is, at least from my opinion, and many of my colleagues as well, absolutely pointless if the interest is to improve and facilitate better transformation, right? So in that respect, many people, and I have to agree with them, tend to see the expropriation as compensation as a political ploy, basically, just to see radical and perform radically just before the elections. And we have upcoming elections next year, so we'll see what is coming out of that again. If we look at the evidence that we are producing, myself, but many others as well, the problems point to implementation problems. Land reform problems are mostly problems that are to do with executive questions, budgetary questions, capacity questions. It's really questions of implementation, not so much questions of law. There are, of course, legal technicalities. There's the Constitution, uh, the Communal Property Associations Act. You can always improve law. There's, it's not free from, from mistakes, but the problem is, I would strongly insist, not on the level of the law, it's implementation, really. And then also, if you are really into radical politics, and I would like to say that I am, if you really think big, then introduce a capital levy, transformation tax, right? The state in South Africa is in a perfect position to actually tax people massively. Contrary to Germany, in South Africa until today, you have a, a simple majority of ANC government. They can just introduce taxation laws, right? They could possibly have a very progressive um, taxation and thereby expropriate a lot of money and redistribute it in the society. And that would produce much more money, much quicker, and it's beyond constitutional um, a complaint because it's at the capacity of the state to decide how to tax, right? So if you want to do that, 
they are much better ways, it's faster, you can get more money out of it, and I would also argue it's much juster because so many people in South Africa benefited from apartheid but are not landowners, right? If you think about industry mining, for instance, right? They benefited massively through the 350 years of apartheid and colonialism, but they are not landowners. So they don't have to pay for the cost of land reform, but they should. If you have a progressive taxation, you can quickly get everybody to pay. You can do it immediately, you have the majority in parliament, but you have to have the political will, why don't you do it? And then, of course, if you have more money, so rather reducing the cost for the state in very minuscule situations for paying less for individual farms, think big and get a lot of money in the revenue. But if you have the money then, what do you want to do with that? And many people have been saying, possibly land reform is not the best way to spend the state money because the benefit-cost ratio is very bad. It's very expensive, but very often land is dead. Agriculture is a very uh, non-lucrative business in South Africa. It was only working during apartheid because you had a core family of white farmers and then underpaid basic slaves who were doing unpaid and low-paid work on the farms, right? If you pay minim minimum wage, as you have to do now, agriculture is not a, not a business that really pays. So even if people sit on land that is worth 20, 30 million th uh, rand, the output, agricultural output, actually is minimal. So the benefit for the owners is very, economically is very minimal. So rather, give the money out in basic income grants and give money, poor the society with money and let them spend it for what they want to uh, use it. I think that would be much better and many people are saying that. So this is the kind of normative bit and that's where I'm ending. Um, since I'm very positioned on that question as you hear, um, what I did is I organized a conference um, with uh, property lawyers, um, land reform specialists and redistributive justice specialists at the Stellenbosch Institute for Advanced Study. Uh, where we had a conference last year on that question and the book which is coming out now it went into production yesterday i'm very relieved um, is coming out with cambridge university press as an open access book from day one and we of course invited uh, representatives from the political parties from parliament from government to the conference with very minimal attendance i must admit with a strong media presence and we will be touring the country next year and speak truth to power so that's basically the the one thing and in that book, I didn't publish anything on the, in the issue myself. My own opinion that I just presented is going to appear in a different book, which I have been working on here as well, which is a, an edited volume, Reckoning with Law and Excess, which we just put onto, um, under review with Cambridge University Press as well. So that's where I publish my opinion, whereas the other one is really more about facilitating uh, the experts in South Africa to have their voices heard. And that's where I end. Thank you very much.